Good afternoon and welcome to our weekly COVID-19 update for the town of Plymouth. I'm Steve Trifletti, Plymouth Town Moderator. We're here each Wednesday at noon for this update. This forum is being brought to you live by PAC-TV on Comcast Channel 15, Verizon Channel 47. You can also watch this on PAC-TV streaming channel by going to pactv.org slash live. For questions during today's forum, please email plymouthinfo at pactv.org. These forums can be replayed at pactv.org slash Plymouth. Today for update number 86, we have a full group of participants. They include uh, Ken Tavares and Matt Muratori, and we are joined by Dr. Philip Trifletti, Dr. Barry Potvin, Representative Kathleen Lanatra, Carolyn Raines, Michelle Brady, Michael Jackman, Amy Naples, and we're going to begin with Ken Tavares. He is the chair of the Plymouth Select Board. Welcome, Ken. Thank you, Steve, and good afternoon to everyone. I'm going to be uh, very brief because I know that Dr. Potvin and uh, our rep representatives have a great deal of information to uh, bring forward today since there were some changes uh, and I think uh, good news that came about uh, earlier this morning. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, make a comment in regards to the uh, Veterans Vaccination Clinic that's going to take place on Saturday at uh, Plymouth Post 40. It's from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, there is uh, no appointment time, so it's first come, first serve. And uh, we are anticipating that there'll be a number of people showing up for this vaccination. So with that, uh, I want to take the time and turn it back to Dr. Potvin and to our representative. Thank Th you. Thank you. That is Kenneth Tavares. He is chair of the Plymouth Select Board. We're now going to go to our medical uh, portion of our uh, presentation. We're going to begin with Dr. Philip Trifletti. He is an attending primary care physician at Beth Israel Deaconess. Uh, welcome, Dr. Phil. Thanks, Steve, for having me again today. Uh, you know, good news on the vaccine front. You'll hear from me and others uh, on the broadcast, but uh, we're, we're, we're making progress. Um, I just want to just start by reviewing what's happening with the infection rates. I think uh, you know, if you're following the numbers, we're doing much, much better with infection rates. I like to include also the global and the national rates so you get a, a picture how things are going around the globe. I think so it's always important to remember this is a global pandemic. And while a lot of us are focused in our own communities, we also have to think about uh, our strategies both globally and nationally. Um, if you look at the global infections, there's about 109 million infections have been recorded and about 2.4 million deaths globally. And the, the new case rate, if you look at the, the curves for, for new infections, uh, we can see a nice trend globally, much like we're seeing nationally and locally. Um, they peaked about 700,000 new infections per day globally uh, in the last uh, month or two, and now it's down to about 400,000 new infections per day. So it, that's almost uh, half the infection rate that we had several weeks ago. So that's very promising, very good news indeed. Uh, if you look at the national statistics, you'll see roughly the same um, pattern. Uh, we've had a total of 27 million infections here in the United States. We've had almost half a million deaths, 486,000 deaths. And uh, our new cases in the last uh, months to two months had peaked at about 230,000 new cases per day. And now that rate is, is more than half reduced down to about 105,000 cases per day if you look at the 14 day rolling average. So uh, great news nationally as well. Uh, if you look at the state of Massachusetts, we've had a total of 560,000 infections. We've had 16,000 deaths in the state of Massachusetts. And our new cases peaked like the, the global and national rates in the past month or two. We peaked at about 5,700 new cases per day. And now our rate per day is down around 2,400 when you look at the 14-day rolling average. So um, again, about half the rate of new infections. So those, those are very promising numbers right now. I think most experts would say 
And a lot of it's due to uh, the mitigation strategies, the health hygiene, the wearing the masks, the social distancing, et cetera. You know, um, but there could be some contribution starting from vaccinations. There could be, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, some of these other reasons why we're seeing, um, you know, a, a better infection rate. And 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 that's very good news indeed. I know some experts are concerned about having another surge due to the variants, and you know, we'll see what happens, you know, in the coming weeks and months. But but the the trends right now are are really excellent. And um, so hopefully we'll continue to see that. Uh, in terms of the vaccination statistics right now, nationally, there have been about 72 million doses of vaccine distributed and about 55 million doses have been given. Um, so you can see the majority of, of vaccines that have been produced and distributed are already uh, shots in the arm, so to speak. And uh, you know, I think we're doing well with that. Um, there's 50 million people nationally who have been completely vaccinated uh, with these Moderna Pfizer vaccines, we refer to it doubly vaccinated. So that's just slightly less than 5% of the total population. Obviously we'd like our numbers to, you know, continue to, to climb and climb as quickly as possible. Uh, you know, understandable reasons, everybody's very eager to get this vaccine, but you know, we are making progress. And I think, you know, as you've heard in the media, uh, in the last few days, you're going to continue to see a lot of progress. In the state of Massachusetts, we've received about 1.5 million doses, of which 1.1 million doses have been given. That's 76 percent. So again, most all the doses that have been received have been given, uh, and we'll continue to work hard on that. We have, uh, similar to the national statistics, we've had 304,000 Massachusetts residents that have been fully vaccinated, which is is 4.4% of our population. Um, you know, we've been vaccinating about 40,000 per day. Uh, it looks like that rate may be able to increase. Uh, we're hoping, you know, the supply we were receiving from the federal government was roughly 108,000 doses per week. And it looks like it's gonna increase to about 139,000 doses per week. So we're, we're seeing a lot of progress, um, you know, in getting inventory here and that should, should help you know, move those numbers faster. Uh, the big news that you'll hear more about today is um, in phase two, we have been in part one doing uh, those over age 75. And as of Thursday, people who are in the age 65 to 74 age group will be able to make appointments for vaccine, which is very exciting, as well as those with two comorbidities. So so we're, we're going into the next um, stage of phase two for the vaccination program. Um, I did want to make a point, you probably heard of the news, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has um, been brought before the FDA for emergency use authorization. I believe the date, uh, the review will be um, uh, brought forward from the FDA is February 26th. Unlike the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines where uh, there was over 20 million doses of inventory with each manufacturer at the time they received their emergency use authorization with Johnson & Johnson, you know, they don't have a lot of in inventory produced yet. And that's part of the reason in the media, you've heard, you know, a uh, change in projections as to when we'll have enough vaccine for everyone. It, you know, may take a few, several more weeks because Johnson Johnson is, is a, a bit behind on their production schedule compared to the original forecasts. But um, we're very optimistic that um, the Johnson Johnson vaccine will get emergency use authorization. All the vaccines, are extremely effective for preventing hospitalizations and deaths, and also effective appears all against the, the newer variants that are being discovered. So it looks like we're still in very good position with our vaccine program and trying to, you know, stop the pandemic and get back to, you know, more normal life. Um, in regards to, you know, how to get vaccinated, you'll probably hear more on the broadcast, but, you know, it is frustrating. You know, I have patients all the time calling me, emailing me, you know, asking me, you know, how can I get vaccinated? Um, and, you know, again, being honest, you know, we just don't have enough vaccine right now to go around to everybody who wants one, you know, as frustrating as that is. But, you know, I do believe that in a matter of several weeks or a few months, you know, you're going to hit that tipping point where we're going to have plenty of vaccine for everyone that wants one. And, and really, we're going to be focused more on uh, chasing people who are, have been hesitant to take the vaccine. Um, you know, I'm sure you'll, you'll hear more in the broadcast about 
um, some of the advances the state has made, but they've made some great new changes, I think, to uh, helping people get appointments. You know, they have now a call center 211, which is a United Way call center. And for people that don't have internet access for booking appointments online, they can call 211 uh, in the state of Massachusetts to help get help in booking a vaccine. On the mass.gov website, they now have a vax finder and they, they reorient, reoriented the website. So now the website helps you find the first available appointment. And when I looked this morning, for instance, at the mass vaccination site in Gillette, they had 370 appointments available this morning uh, for Friday. So, um, you know, there's, there's good appointment availability. Uh, if people are able to get the transportation and get there, uh, you know, I think it's a great, great option. Uh, and then of course, um, in the last, a week or so, we've, we've had the, the change in policy where uh, when you go to the mass vaccination site like Gillette, you could uh, bring a companion, and your companion can get vaccinated if it's your first dose. Uh, so that's a nice uh, new opportunity for people who maybe don't fit into the, the first two parts of phase two of vaccination program. Um, as I mentioned, you know, there's too many people uh, still hesitant. However, I think if you were looking in, in uh, the media you've seen, uh, you know, prisons are a good example where you know a lot of the prison staff have been reluctant to take the vaccines. Uh, you also see published media reports in long-term care facilities, skilled nursing facilities. A lot of people are, are not the staff are not taking their shots. Very disappointing. I think we have to come up with strategies for how to uh, get more people vaccinated. I think when the supply becomes more abundant, I think you will see you know greater eff efforts and hopefully. Uh, eventually even mandates, um, you know, to have vaccines, I would certainly endorse that. Uh, I think it's important to remember, you know, there, I've seen no reported deaths anywhere in the world from the vaccine. Obviously, there have been very rare isolated reports of uh, some allergic reactions, but, you know, it's very safe. And I just, I can't emphasize enough, of course, you cannot get infected from this vaccine. There's no live ingredient there that could infect you. So, um, there's also some other concerns. I know you have some young women worry about fertility issues. There's no issues uh, known about uh, impairing fertility or affecting pregnancy. So, um, you know, I think these are completely safe and, and I would not delay, you know, I, sometimes people ask me, should I delay taking my vaccine because of something going on in their life? And I say, absolutely not. You know, if, if you have an opportunity to schedule your vaccine, don't wait, uh, you know, get it right away. Um, I do like to reassure people, um, you know, there's been occasional media reports about vaccine being wasted. I, I honestly do not believe that's happening on any significant scale. I actually checked with our uh, own hospital network and I was reassured that they are not wasting any doses. They only thaw what they need and then they give it. Uh, so I think while there could have been some isolated uh, problems, especially early in distribution phases, I don't believe that's happening uh, to any extent at all. Um, there have been some media reports about vaccine hunters, people who are not uh, eligible yet for vaccines, but trying to find leftover vaccines. And I think there have been, you know, a few outlets where, you know, you could get on a waiting list, like Farewell Urgent Care Center, for example, uh, had a waiting list for people that wanted to find leftover vaccine. But I, I, I think those are fairly scarce opportunities. And probably your best bet is just waiting till your number comes up. Uh, you know, with the reg reg regular vaccine protocol, you know, as we move forward. Um, once you've been vaccinated, you know, it's important to remember you still are encouraged, of course, to have all the same safety practices, wear a mask. You know, we do believe there is a small risk that you can be infected once you've had, had your vaccine. Um, and we wouldn't want people who have been vaccinated getting infected and then spreading it to people who are not protected, especially vulnerables. So, uh, so please continue to wear your back, your masks, even if you've been vaccinated. Um, in regards to mask quality, I just want to update people again to be aware um, that the masks that are being recommended by the CDC have two or more layers. If it's a cloth mask or wearing a surgical mask, you want to make sure the mask covers your nose. You want to make sure that it's very snug on your cheek um, and that it has a nose wire here that you can press to get a tight fit in the air seal. Um, if you wear cloth masks, you can wash those in your washing machine and dry them in your dryer.
to make sure they stay clean and you should wash them regularly. Um, so uh, at this point, they're still advising not to use N95 masks if, unless you're in the healthcare setting. I think it's really to conserve the supply in case we have any more problems with PPE supply. Um, since you are vaccinated, if you're doubly vaccinated, I think you know there will be new guidelines from the CDC about what's safe activities, but certainly if you can get together with others who are also been doubly vaccinated, you know, you, then you could probably, you know, if it's just that group of people who have all been vaccinated together, you know, they're safe to probably not wear their masks and enjoy, you know, more relaxed, normal setting. So that's what I have to start. Uh, good news. You know, we keep making progress. And as always, I'll be happy to answer questions at the end of the broadcast. Thank you again, Steve, for having me. Thank you, and that's Dr. Philip Trifletti, an attending primary care physician, Beth Israel Deaconess. You can send your questions to our panel at PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. We're going to continue with our medical segment, and we welcome back Dr. Barry Potvin. He's going to be talking about what's happening in Plymouth. He is the chair of the Plymouth Board of Health. Welcome, Barry. Yes, thanks, Steve. I have so much to cover today. I'll, I'll try to do it efficiently because I know there's you know, a lot more people on the panel today that need to have some time also. Um, so first thing I wanted to tell you about was just a little bit about the data. Um, the process of the number of cases we have in Plymouth right now, as of yesterday or for yesterday, there were just 11 new cases. That's a total of 3,646 cases here in Plymouth. Um, there were unfortunately four new deaths reported yesterday alone. So now the total number of deaths in Plymouth is 134. Uh, there is some new data, if I can attempt to uh, get it to you. Let's see if this is... Um, so I just shake your head yes, if you can see the graph. Okay, um, so this was a, a data as of last Thursday. It comes out weekly on Thursdays. And this is just for Plymouth. You can see the average daily cases over for 100,000 people over 14 days has been dropping steadily for the past three or four weeks. It is now down to um, 51.4. We are sort of getting closer to getting out of the red zone, which is the high risk category and going down, I hope in another week or so into the yellow zone, which I think may have a positive impact uh, for the school system as well because there's new rules coming out about transportations for the school system. Um, if you also look at what's going on in the state over a period of time starting in November, you can see the same sort of downward trend. And it's been a fairly significant drop off in, in the cases. So that's certainly good news. Um, if you also look at this data, which I've been tabulating routinely every week, uh, you'll notice that for the most recent data, which is here, uh, we had uh, over 14 days, 627 new cases. Um, that gave us a 71.4, a little further down. This is the most recent data, 451 cases, 51.4 cases that were positive per 100,000 people and a positive test rate of 5.45%. So we're getting awfully close to getting out of the red zone. Um, and I'm very hopeful that's gonna be happening very, very shortly. So just a couple other things to show you. Um, one is the latest information that came out just in the last couple of days. So this is copied right off of the announcements. Um, vaccination event for veterans on this Saturday at the American Legion there's a federally run vaccination clinic for veterans that are 55 years of age or older. So this is a younger cutoff. Um, and that's because they're under federal rules. They get their vaccine directly from a federal source. So they're not drawing their vaccine from the state supply. It's gonna be led by the uh, Veterans Administration, Boston Public Affairs Director. He's gonna run these clinics. He'll supply the vaccines. He'll supply wheelchairs, oxygen tanks, staff of about 30 professionals. It's going to run on Saturday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. on a first come first serve basis. The American Legion is on Federal Furnace Road. It'll be in their function room. 
Uh, the second shot will be administered on Saturday, March 20th at the same schedule and same location. Town will provide police presence for security and traffic control. Um, and the Brewster Ambulance is going to have a dedicated ambulance on site in case anyone has a uh, reaction to the vaccinations. Um, should be pointed out, in order to be eligible for this, you must be registered with the VA. Um, so you must have been getting treatment from the VA um, at some point. Uh, also caregivers that are registered with the VA under their caregivers program uh, would also be eligible uh, for the vaccines. This came out just this morning. Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito announced that tomorrow, February 18th, individuals 65 or older, also individuals with two or more specific medical conditions. And there's a list of those that's available. And residents and staff of public and private low income and affordable senior housing will all for the first time be eligible to receive the vaccine. This is going to be about a million new individuals that are gonna become eligible starting tomorrow morning. So that's going to create quite a large demand, as you can imagine, for uh, vaccination appointments. And if you look at what we can use for getting the vaccines, um, there are vaccine sites. Many of them are um, smaller municipal sites and are only open to some residents. Um, they're going to be cutting off vaccine supply to municipal sites that are only for one town they will still be serving uh, vaccination sites that are more regional collaborative sort of operations. And I assume that would include things like um, oh, the Marshfield Fairgrounds, uh, possibly these others, which are grocery stores, the big Y, the Hannaford, the Stop and Shop that are in adjoining towns, the CVS and Hanover. Um, they're supposed to be currently about to open a brand new mass vaccination site down in Dartmouth at the old Circuit City store. The vaccine is going to still be delivered, of course, at the huge site at Gillette Stadium. And keep in mind that new appointments are posted every Thursday morning by 8.30 a.m. So there's going to be probably a crush of people trying to get these appointments because it's going to be suddenly a million more people trying to get them. So you need to be patient. You need to be perseverant and probably the huge crush of demand for new appointments will taper off after a little while as it did for the 75 plus group. And it may eventually in a week or two get a little bit easier to get the appointments. Um, there's a restricted site um, at Colony Place that the hospital BID Plymouth was going to open. Um, unfortunately, the state decided that they're gonna stop delivering new vaccine supplies to these hospital groups, but that decision was made on a temporary basis and they may be able to eventually restore the vaccine supply um, to those kind of groups. We're also still trying to get state approval for a huge new mass vaccination site at the Kingston Collection Mall. And with all these people, a million coming in tomorrow that need the vaccinations, we possibly might be lucky and hopeful that they might approve this site soon so that we can offer something that would be available in a much more reasonably close location for everybody, not only here in the Plymouth area, but also the people out on the Cape um, that probably would find this a lot closer to get to than going all the way out to um, Gillette Stadium in Foxborough. So other things to point out, um, the state is now getting 110,000 new doses per week in Massachusetts. That's not a lot when you got a million new people trying to get the vaccine. The state is now pleased that they have actually improved their uh, vaccine distribution. And they are now listed as the ninth or 10th best state in the, in the US in terms of giving out the vaccine in large amounts um, as soon as it's received. Uh, in terms of what's happened with the 75 plus residents, uh, there is about 251,000 of them that have now received one dose, the first dose of the vaccine. And that's about 52% of the total 75 plus people that were eligible to receive the vaccine. Um, in terms of what's going on with the variants, I know I'm going fast. I hope I don't take your breath away. Um, 
this just gives you an idea of what's going on with these variants. There's a UK variant and there's now apparently um, something like, uh, I think it's about 29 cases of this that have been found in Massachusetts. And only four of them came from people that were had a history of travel. So the rest of it has been coming about because of, of community transmission. Just yesterday, there was a notice that there was one case of the South African variant that also popped up in one 20 year old, 20 something year old woman. Um, that's the first time that's been seen in the state of Massachusetts as well. So that's concerning. Um, you notice that there are specific changes in these virus particles. And these numbers and letters you see here just mean that uh, one amino acid that's been abbreviated with N in the 501st position um, changed to a, from a Y. And because of that, the virus can bind more strongly to the cells and apparently becomes more infectious and more easily transmitted. The one in the South African variant that's worrisome is this one. And it's associated at least in the case of the AstraZeneca vaccine with a tenfold weaker antibody binding, which may mean the antibody wouldn't work so well against that. Um, just to give you a picture, I showed this at our Board of Health meeting, but here is a picture of the spike protein um, on the surface of the virus. That's this red structure you see here sticking off the surface of a virus particle. This is the position of that new mutation that's occurred in the UK variant. And this blue structure is actually the receptor that's on the surface of the cells the virus infects. So you can see if you change this, you may well change and has changed the ability of the virus to bind to the surface of the cells and cause infection. Um, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to show you um, in terms of what happens after you get vaccinated. Here is Dr. Fauci. And the CDC has now recommended that double masking may actually be much more effective than single mask wearing. And you can see Dr. Fauci has two masks on one over the other. They both fit very closely against the side of the face and across the nose. And this apparently can give you about a 90 to 95% protection against um, getting virus particles that are suspended in the air inhaled and also protect people around you from the same sort of thing. So what's going to happen when everybody gets the vaccine? Well, you still have to wear masks, preferably double masks. Um, it probably is going to be somewhat safer to gather in small groups that don't live in your household as long as they have all been vaccinated, especially in circumstances where people are not all wearing masks, but that's kind of um, not fully established yet. Um, you probably should expect that what's going to happen also with the vaccine, because this virus actually mutates fairly quickly, but not as bad as the flu virus, that going forward, we're going to be seeing this as part of our routine fall vaccination protocols. So not only the flu vaccine, but also the COVID vaccine, it'll be changed every year. It'll be made specific to whatever mutant is more prevalent at that time according to whatever predictions that they can make. So it's just gonna be what they know as a multivalent vaccine. Um, and it'll be, it'll be given and it will have to change every year to cope with the changing way in which this virus actually mutates and becomes more risky again. Barry, so your screen share that was, was off if you- fast. Go ahead. Go ahead, Barry. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, I thought I had turned on the screen share completely, but maybe it went off. So I don't have time to go back to it right now. Okay. Um, but, you know, that's about all I can do. The target for Massachusetts is to give 4.1 million vaccinations to the residents of Massachusetts. And they haven't even reached 1 million with the first dose yet. So they have a long ways to go. Um, but hopefully we'll get there as quickly as possible and things will get better over the next couple of months. Uh, thank you, Steve. I know that was a lot to pour in very, very quickly, but I did my best. Thank you, Dr. Barry Potvin. He is chair of the Plymouth Board of Health. At this time, we welcome back Representative Kathleen Linatra. She represents Plymouth, Kingston, and several other towns. Uh, welcome, Representative Linatra. Good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you, Steve. 
for having me. And thank you to Dr. Tripoletti and Dr. Poppin. That was a wealth of knowledge of information um, that you just gave to us. Uh, a lot of it is the information that I have in front of me that I hate to repeat, but just as a reminder, anyone that's 65 or older um, is available to make an appointment. Um, unfortunately, that's an, an additional million people that are eligible for that. So patience is of great importance. It may take up to a month for people to get um, an appointment for their first vaccine. Several of our first responders have received their second vaccine, my husband being one of them, and luckily had no repercussions, even though he was told that he would have some not fun conditions from that second vaccine, and he is fine. We are still continuing to work um, as the delegation, the South Shore delegation, on having a vaccine, regional vaccine at Kingston Collection. That is a call that we uh, make daily to DPH to see how that's going. They still are uh, focusing on our underserved communities, is uh, what I've been told. Um, and it is unfortunate, uh, Dr. Poppin had mentioned, I spoke to BID Leahy Clinic last week, and they were very excited to tell me about the Pier 1 import, and they just got the call before that, that they will not have those vaccines available, which was very disheartening to all of us. Um, but, it, you know, as it, I think the main word here is patience. You know, they open up new appointments, and you have to, you just can't check once, you just have to keep checking. And... As a delegation, we will continue to work with our Board of Health and our town administrators on the South Shore to really push for that regional, regional vaccine place at Kingston Collection, which I think will be helpful to everyone, especially our seniors. Um, DPH and the Baker administration is going to work with our Board of Health as well. Um, I'm looking through my notes here. They want to have plan to vaccinate our homebound individuals in their community and our older adults in private and public low income and affordable housing. They want to encourage residents to get vaccinated at mass vaccination sites, retail pharmacies, and other locations that are open to all residents. Um, I do think Dr. Poppin mentioned there's a place here in Kingston too. It's called Skin Esteem. It's a med spa, and they've been offering appointments. They're doing 300 weekly. That may be something that you could look into. Uh, people that are local to Kingston, um, our North Plymouth residents, should look into that. But that's all I have, Steve. I think most of the information was already put forth, but happy to be here and happy to listen. And I do have questions at the end for the doctors, too. So if you could keep that in mind. Thank you. And that's Kathleen Lenatra. She's the Plymouth. Uh, state representative uh, for Plymouth, Kingston, and several other towns. And at this time, we're going to move to our education portion. We welcome back Carolyn Rain. She's Director of Health Services for the Plymouth Public Schools. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for having me today. Um, I think I just want to start off by saying that we have been, you know, consistently reviewing our data in the schools. And um, it's so refreshing to see our February numbers um, dropping. Um, for the school age children. I think that, you know, obviously December and January, our numbers were peaking pretty heavily um, in terms of just not only positive cases, but a lot of our students um, needing to quarantine. Um, again, the major um, issue being household transmission for our families. Um, I think that we did have some, some of, um, issues in some of our special programs where we did have some in-school um, concerns and had staff and other students needing to quarantine. Um, but so far in the last few weeks, I mean, our numbers are, you know, again, looking really much better. So I think one of the, one of the big things that we were looking at is how can we add another primary prevention strategy to our toolbox um, in terms of keeping our students and staff healthy and safe. And um, we did, you know, certainly research the pool testing option that the state um, was rolling out for schools um, and just really felt that um, there were other options that were available um, to us as a school district that would be um, probably a, a better a better opportunity. So we did um, have a contract, we do have a contract now with a company called One Health um, and we're offering COVID surveillance testing to our students and our, and our, and our families um, and staff. Over, so for over the February vacation, um, people that were interested, we had everybody fill out permission slips and pick up test kits um, the unique piece with this um, specific test is it's a PCR saliva test, so much less invasive than the nasopharyngeal swabbing, which I think is, in terms of like young children, I think is very beneficial. 
Um, we certainly were sharing information with our families regarding the state travel guidance, making sure that everybody was familiar with the expectations are in terms of returning back to Massachusetts. Um, but still, you know, other than, you know, anybody who had been infected with the, with the virus or who, who had COVID in the last 90 days, anybody except those people were obviously able to take the test. Um, and, you know, individuals are going to be able to do the test several days prior to returning to school on Monday. Um, put the kit right in the mail and it goes by FedEx and the company receives it and has um, informed us that, you know, we will have the results in two days. So we're looking forward to being able to do some, you know, obviously the routine surveillance piece um, for asymptomatic people who have traveled. I think that's going to be really, um, you know, certainly beneficial. I think that one of the one of the um, highlights too is that you know moving forward, um, any of my health office staff that had opted to check, get the vaccine are actually getting their second vaccine this week, um, so that's you know really good news for us. Um, and again, I think that one of the big pieces is that you know moving forward into phase two, looking at our teaching staff, looking at our school staff in general, um, and hoping that we can certainly partner and collaborate um, with the town moving forward and, and whoever else with the state in terms of making sure that all of our staff are offered the vaccine um, in a timely manner. So I think that, you know, I don't really have too much other news. Again, I know it was mentioned about Harbor Health having some extra vaccine, which was really great for us. Um, they did, the nursing director there has been very collaborative, reached out to us um, in terms of any other support staff who, um, occupational therapists, speech therapists, physical therapists who had not had an opportunity to get the vaccine were offered this opportunity, which was great. Um, and I think the community collaboration piece is enormous and moving forward as we move into April, looking, getting kids um, returning to full in time, you know, full learning in school learning. Um, there's certain criteria that need to be met. Um, obviously one of the bigger pieces is the community piece. Um, you know, making sure our community numbers um, are looking good, staying down. I mean, it's, it's been great to see Karen Keene's update every day. Um, our numbers are looking much more promising. They're dropping, which I think is, is very important, obviously, for the schools. Um, and again, just, you know, looking forward to getting everybody back from February vacation and, um, you know, staying healthy and safe. And I, you know, certainly can answer any questions if anybody has any at the end of the program but I, pre I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn Rain. She is the Director of Health Services for the Plymouth Public Schools. You can send the questions to PlymouthInfo at pactv.org. And now we've just heard about our children. We're gonna move on to our seniors. We welcome back Michelle Brady. She is the Director of Elder Affairs for the Town of Plymouth. Welcome, Michelle. Hi, Steve. Thank you so much. Um, as always, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to PACTV. And hello to my fellow esteemed panelists. Well, it's not surprising the vaccine remains the focal point for our senior community, 75 plus. We're getting so many calls from seniors who are still concerned with getting their vaccine and access to vaccines. And the 65 plus community are questioning when they will be eligible. Question answered, you will be tomorrow. It goes without saying Cal is a very busy place these days. All current information on the COVID-19 vaccine can be found at www.mass.gov backslash COVID vaccine 75. There's many great websites on the mass.gov site, um, mass.gov backslash COVID-19 vaccine and appointments can be scheduled at mass.gov COVID vaccine. Melissa, I believe if you could be kind enough, she's going to put that information up on the screen so you can access and visually see the different websites. That would be great. Thank you. I do want to assure our senior community that despite the barriers of supply and demand, and you've heard a lot about that already today, and we continuously do give you the message of be, please be patient. We understand your frustration and are here for you. If you reach out to us, we will gladly help you navigate the vaccination options that are currently available. And even if a desired appointment is not available at that time, we will continue to assist you and support you until your goal is achieved. You will be vaccinated. 
There are times that Cal receives phone calls from local vaccination sites that have an overage of vaccines that they must distribute immediately, typically the same day. If you would like to be your name to be placed on a wait list at Cal, if that situation occurs, please call us at 508-830-4230 and let us know that you would like to be placed on this emergency call list. It's important that if we get those calls for businesses and there are overages, we can reach you immediately and no, yes, there's no guarantees that you'll be called or will be called, but we wanna make sure our seniors are able to take advantage of a local vaccination opportunity at every chance we get. I wanted to also share um, the exciting vaccine opportunity for veterans. And um, if by the end of this broadcast, you don't have this information down, um, I'll be number three in line. But there is a flyer that I would like to show if Melissa can kindly bring up that flyer so you can visually see um, the Veterans Vaccination Event this Saturday, February 20th at the American Legion Post 40. Um, as Barry had stated, um, and as um, Representative Lenatra had stated, this is a federally run vaccination clinic for eligible veterans 55 plus years old and older led by a Boston Public Affairs Director, Kyle Toto, who has successfully run these clinics and will supply the vaccines, wheelchairs, oxygen tanks, and staff of about 30 professionals. This is going to run Saturday the 20th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. first come, first serve. The rest is on the flyer, but please know that you do have to be enrolled in the VA healthcare system to participate in this clinic. In addition to actively pursuing and seeking a regional site at the Kingston Mall Collection in partnership with the town of Kingston, the town has four immediate focal points in terms of vaccinations. Getting together a ready list of names, phone numbers and ages to provide any vaccination site that has leftover vaccines during their clinics. As I mentioned earlier, I really encourage you, I want you to call Cal if you'd like to be on those emergency call list sites. Please call us and give us your information. Number two, ensuring that we have adequate supply to complete the second round of doses for public safety officials. We're still focused on understanding that we need to finish our phase one, our very important public safety officials. Proceeding with the above mentioned vaccination clinic in Plymouth for Veterans on Saturday and establishing and coordinating the mobile clinic for our homebound seniors and non-seniors very concerned about our homebound seniors and want to make sure that they are taken care of as well. In addition, the town was considering using the Center for Active Living and Memorial Hall as potential site possibilities. But in light of Dr. Potman's announcement, the state is not supplying vaccinations after March 1st to municipal operations. So at this time, that would not be feasible. As part of the effort on vaccinating our homebound residents, the town is working with Old Colony Elder Services, who is a great Cal and community partner and supports all of our COVID-19 vaccination plans, specifically helping our efforts, identifying Plymouth's homebound older adult population. It's great to have community camaraderie and people coming together for those seniors and others who are homebound. Lastly, I had a very special senior call me and ask me to wish her a happy birthday on this show. She is the number one fan and never misses an episode. So happiest of birthdays to you, Eileen. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Michelle Braddy. She is the Director of Elder Affairs <laughs> uh, for the Town of Plymouth. Please send your questions to PlymouthInfo at PACTV.org. And now we welcome our federal partner, uh, Michael Jackman. He is a district director in Congressman William Keating's office. Uh, welcome, Mike. Thank you, Steve, and thank you to PAC TV as always for this opportunity to talk to folks about what's going on um, in the COVID world at the federal level. I guess, Michelle, I'll be number four to talk about the Veterans uh, Clinic on Saturday. Um, very excited that uh, this opportunity is being made available here in Plymouth for um, our veterans 
55 plus again and enrolled in the uh, healthcare, VA healthcare system. Um, just another way to get the vaccine out to people, which is so important and something that we're working on um, down in Congress as well. Um, people are asking about uh, the, the next uh, relief package and the, uh, the next uh, economic impact payment or stimulus. Nothing has been passed yet. The American Rescue Plan, which is what President Biden is calling this new legislation, is uh, kind of coming together. And the uh, proposal right now is for an additional economic impact payment of $1,400 per taxpayer. Um, a lot of the details have to be worked out in terms of the income limits, um, in term, you know, what your adjusted gross income it must be to be eligible for the uh, payment. And um, we think that a lot of that will be uh, hammered out in the uh, debate and in, in, in the, the back and forth between the House and the Senate. A lot of funding has been included in the American Rescue Plan for vaccine distribution and for uh, testing because um, the president, as we know, is talking a lot about reopening schools and getting as many teachers and families vaccinated as possible and also as much testing, as Carolyn referred to, um, for school, school communities um, is, is so important to make sure that we can reopen our schools safely. And uh, administration is working towards that goal. And uh, the American Rescue Plan will be a big part of that. Um, it is tax season uh, is upon us, which is maybe not the brightest prospect for some people, but for some people, it's uh, important to get those taxes in. Uh, looking back to round one and two of the economic impact payment that were um, approved back in the spring of 2020. And again, round two, which was approved just in December of last year. Folks who did not receive those rounds, the $1,200 check and the $600 check or payment, um, but feel that they were eligible, they can claim that as a credit on their 2020 taxes. So the 2020 tax forms will look a little bit different this year. There will be a line if you haven't got your tax form yet or gone online to take a look at it, there is a line, it's line 30, I believe, three zero, that will allow you to calculate your recovery rebate credit if you did not receive the economic impact payment directly from the federal government. If you have any questions about that, feel free to call our office, 508-746-9000, um, and we will provide as much information as we can. And uh, at this point, the IRS is not issuing any more round two payments. So folks who have not got, gotten it by now will have to reconcile that on their 2020 tax forms. Um, I think that's all I really have. A lot of, uh, a lot of good information today, a lot of changes with uh, what's going on with the vaccine. Last thing I guess I will say is that, the, as I think Dr. Tripletti alluded to, more vaccine is going out every week. And uh, that's a good sign. Um, it's very important to get the vaccine to the state so they can get it to the sites where it's available to people. Um, and, uh, you know, the federal government is doing what it can and working with the companies to get the vaccine out. We totally support that and are looking at the American Rescue Plan as a way to provide even more support to that process. So that's all I have today. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Michael Jackman. He is District Director, Congressman William Keating's office. He's available to answer questions as we move with our panel now to the business portion. And uh, Amy Naples, we welcome back. She's the executive director, Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. Welcome, Amy. Hi, Steve. Great to see you and great to see the fellow panelists. Lots of great information. First, though, I do want to wish Eileen a very happy birthday. I thought that was very sweet. So I couldn't miss the opportunity. I love celebrations um, and I hope Eileen is celebrating well today. So we have heard great progress on vaccines and infection numbers and I am happy to report that we have also made progress on our economic health. We are hearing promising feedback from our local businesses and spending in Massachusetts remains strong in the fourth quarter and is actually up from 2019 numbers. However, we do expect this to slow down this first quarter um, due to cold weather, um, snow, 
And historically, February, March are always very challenging months, but we do know the vaccine will allow for a gradual and steady reopening um, on our economy, which we know is a big progress. Um, we have seen remarkable gains as well in unemployment levels um, in Massachusetts and Plymouth County in particular. So January reported um, 3.9%. And to give you that comparison, May of 2020, which was at one of our highest rates, we were at 18.5. So we've made considerable gains, which is so great and promising to see. And now to give you some chamber news. Um, so attention all foodies. The Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce Restaurant Week is back with a new spin and a new name. We are um, launching a local eats week, which will be held March 19th through the 26th and is geared toward a takeout edition, um, as well as, of course, utilizing those top 40% seats, best seats in the house at our local restaurants. So participating restaurants will be offering exclusive deals and specials for $20 and 21 cents all week long. It's a great time to try a new restaurant, Please remember also that ordering takeout is being supportive and is also delicious. So this is a great opportunity to support our local restaurants. So be sure to save the date March 19th through the 26th. I'm sure I'll be back to tell you more about that. Um, and as I mentioned before, March is a, a tough month for retailers um, and restaurants. So that is why we are launching that here. Um, as we know, there's not too many holidays and vacations during that time. So we always like to have something to spike sales. So keep that in mind in um, supporting your local business. But for the complete listing of all participating restaurants, you can visit localeatsweek.com. We are working with the restaurants, so we don't have a complete listing on there, but stay tuned. And lastly, I wanted to report, um, we are hosting a mega mixer tomorrow night Thursday, February 18th from 5.30 to 7, of course, via Zoom. Um, so for perhaps the first time in record history, eight chambers from the southeastern Massachusetts have banded together for a fun and exciting virtual mega mixer. The concept is designed to help you meet new people, get the word out about your business, and just have a great time, see people, right? All from the comfort of your home or office. There'll be representatives from the Cape Cod Canal Chamber, our friend Maria Oliva, who's been on the show here a couple of times, Cranberry Country Chamber, Metro South, One South Coast, obviously us, Taunton Chamber, Tritown Chamber, and United Regional Chamber. So we have all gathered together. We're going to have a super fun, interactive, entertaining night, um, which will include breakout rooms, games, and of course, prizes. So this is a great opportunity to network with over 100 local businesses. And you can do so by registering at PlymouthChamber.com. Thank you, Steve, as always, for allowing me to provide the business update. Thank you, Amy Naples. She's the Executive Director of Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. We now move to our State of the State weekly message from Plymouth Representative Matthew Muratoris. Welcome, Matt. Hey, Steve. How are you doing today? Um, on behalf of Representative Lenatra and myself, we want to wish uh, Eileen a very happy birthday. Uh, and also, we want to thank the uh, everyone who's been working on putting that veterans clinic together this weekend. It's 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 amazing when people can get together and what they can do, and and really supporting our veterans is so important too. So we appreciate that as well. Uh, I I have been monitoring the governor's press conference since we uh, since we got on air, Steve. So I want to just give you a few highlights here. Uh, first of all, uh, currently there are 170 vaccine sites open in the Commonwealth at this point. And as of next week, um, Dartmouth and Natick will be opening up. Those will be two super sites. So there'll be six super sites at that point that will join uh, Dartmouth and Natick will join Dartmouth. Uh, I'm sorry, will join um, Fenway Park, Gillette Stadium, Danvers, and Springfield. Um, now, people always ask too about the appointments. We know the appointments start on Thursday, uh, but you don't have to get up at midnight to do that. The appointments open up around eight o'clock in the morning on Thursday. So we just uh, were announced too that the vaccines went from 110,000 that we usually get every week uh, to today we got 139,000. And we expect that to be the total that we'll get on a weekly basis as well going forward. So we are seeing you know, a little bit more of an increase from the federal government on the vaccines. But again, you're, you can start making those appointments at eight o'clock uh, tomorrow morning, Thursday morning, um, February 18th. And, and just as, as it was indicated earlier, there are a million people in the category of 65 plus and those with two uh, comorbidities as well. So 
um, you know, just keep in mind, be patient, as everyone is saying, there's only 139 vaccines to go around. So uh, if there's a million people looking for them, you can do the math. It's not gonna, it's not gonna happen overnight. So you can keep trying and keep going back every week, we'll get more and more. So uh, the goal is to within a month to get the 65 plus age group done and those with two comorbid comorbidities as, as well. Um, and that doesn't mean that folks who are still 75 still can't do that, they still can. Uh, anybody in phase one who still doesn't have a vaccination yet, they can still make their appointments as well. So, um, so feel free to uh, to do that. I do want to um, just give um, on the on the two uh, comorbidities or medical conditions. I just want to give a list of those. Uh, by the way, those are for 16 and older. So, if you have two medical conditions that that either are asthma, uh, moderate to severe asthma, cancer, chronic kidney disease, COPD, heart condition. Down syndrome, obesity, um, sickle cell, uh, smoking, or type 2 diabetes, or if you have a weakened immune system from organ transplants, then you will qualify for, um, uh, for the vaccine. Um, also, I know Dr. Potvin talked about the, um, the ranking, uh, the letter that we got this morning from Secretary Sutters. Um, there were some other rankings that Mass went up in as well. And as we said on this show previously, you know, that uh, Massachusetts was getting beat up a little bit because it was getting, it was falling behind with the amount of uh, distribution of vaccines. Um, but there was, there was a reason for that. And we talked about that on this show. Um, and, and it's because we went to the most vulnerable populations in the Commonwealth, long-term care facilities, uh, uh, dis homes with uh, folks with disabilities, uh, et cetera. So, but now we're starting to catch up. So as Dr. Podman mentioned, um, we were um, um, ninth in the U.S. Uh, for vaccines per capita for first doses. Um, also, last week, um, uh, Mass was um, fifth for total shots administered per capita uh, this past week among all 50 states. Um, we were number four in first doses and total doses administered uh, among the 24 states with 5 million or more people. And we were 10th out of 50 states uh, for the first uh, dose of vaccines per capita. So you can see, Steve, we're, we're beginning to, to catch up. And as I predicted we would, we would be up there in the top 10 very shortly and we'll continue to do that because now the populations that we're doing are people gonna, that are gonna be coming to these sites. So um, I also do wanna, um, I know a couple of folks have, have um, emailed me during this broadcast, just to clarify the, um, the Beth Israel Leahy site that's opened right now at um, the Pier 1 and Colony Place. Those appointments that they've made for the next couple of weeks will still be honored, as will the doses, the second doses uh, that they'll be making for appointments as well. So the state will be sure to make sure those folks will get their appointments, they'll get their vaccines, and they'll get their second doses as well. So we want to make sure you know, people have that information as well. Uh, with regards to the total number of vaccines we distributed through uh, yesterday, it's over 1.16 um, 1 million vaccinations. That's 76.4% of the vaccines we received have been distributed. 862,000 of those are first doses and 305,000 of those are second doses. So we're getting the vaccines out quicker. Uh, right now we're in the mode of... Um, it's, it's getting to, it's getting, um, to be more, more efficient, um, um, more ready, as it become more readily available, uh, speed is of the essence as well, which is why you know, you're, we're seeing more super sites, more regional sites make more sense. The smaller sites where people are getting you know, two or 300 doses don't seem to make so much sense as we're trying to get these vaccines out quicker to people um, as, we, as we continue to move forward. The other, I just want to give a quick overview, Steve, of these two sites, uh, vaxfinder.mass.gov, which is an easy way to find locations near you. Um, and we do have some within, uh, within 10 miles of Plymouth for people to go to. One thing the governor did say today that 95% of the population of the Commonwealth lives within 50, uh, 45 minutes of these super sites. Um, and most people, 95%, live within 30 minutes drive from any pharmacy that has these as well. So, um, and you, we will be seeing more and more. I know um, Representative Lenat just talked about Kingston. I know that's still on the radar screen as a regional site. 
Uh, but that will be when we get more and more vaccine. We need to have, you know, three, four, five hundred thousand a week at least coming in before we can start opening some more sites like that. With regard to the uh, the, the testing, um, I know it's the seven day positivity rate has gone down to 2.22 percent. So vac. So the good news here today, I think we're all hearing, is vaccines are up, and the product and the positivity rate of uh, people getting COVID is down. So. Uh, a lot of a lot of good news, Steve, and um, I think we'll continue to see um, these trends happening over the next several weeks. And that's what I have for you today, Steve. Thank you, Matthew Muratori. He is the Plymouth State Representative. We're now going to go back to our panel. Uh, we have questions uh, for our first panelist, and we're going to also do their closing thoughts. Uh, Dr. Philip Trifletti, uh, questions from Kathleen Lenatra she received from constituents. First, if you've had COVID, what is the likelihood of getting it again, and how long will you test positive after your initial positive test, Dr. Trifletti? Yes, thanks, Steve. Um, from what I've been reading right along, and I just updated myself in the last half an hour here on that topic, reinfections appear to be quite rare. And you know, it really requires that a person who is believed to be reinfected that you know, they've been, been infected with two separate strains of the virus. So they have to do some, you know, special testing that <coughs> isn't routinely done. Uh, but when they've investigated cases around the globe, it looks like it's not likely, uh, although there are some rare cases, you, you probably are not getting reinfected. So that's good news. Um, on the second question, uh, most people do make antibodies to infection and also antibodies to uh, vaccination. And um, when people have had infection, it looks like those antibodies do persist about eight months or so. Um, and there could be some drop off in antibody levels as time goes on. There's other parts of your immunity that uh, help you fight off infection besides antibodies. Um, so uh, yeah, there's still more to learn, I think, about you know how long will natural immunity from infection last? How long will immunity lasts with vaccinations, but it does look like if you've had an infection, your antibodies would last uh, around eight months or so. Thank you. As far as just finishing up the talk, I just want to remind people, um, you know, we've preached a lot today about, you know, uh, how difficult it is to wait for your vaccine. And, and I know how hard that is, but, uh, you know, I think there's, there's great hope on the horizon. And I think once we, you know, uh, get through this next, you know, part of phase two, um, you know, people are going to start to see an abundance of vaccines coming forward in the coming weeks and few months. So, so hang in there, everybody, you know, those vaccines are coming. And in the meantime, you know, continue to do the right things, wear your masks, like Dr. Potvin pointed out, um, you know, it may be that uh, doing a double mask with a surgical mask uh, closest to your face and then covered by a cloth mask and that may provide a very, very strong protection against spread of infection. So yeah, please, uh, you know, uh, until we uh, get to a much lower community spread numbers, which we can find for you as time goes along, continue to take all the proper precautions. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. And that's Dr. Philip Trifletti. He's an attending primary care physician at Beth Israel Deaconess. And we're now going to return back to Dr. Barry Potvin. Barry, what do you have for us? Uh, well, I think the, the take home is pretty obvious. Um, just uh, as in addition to all this positive, hopeful information, should point out that almost all the epidemiologists and healthcare professionals are still saying that because of these variants and the increased infectivity that's associated with them, we must remain cautious and vigilant, um, probably for another couple of months. We've already been there, through this for a year. I think everybody can manage to do it for another couple of months. Um, we don't really have any choice until we make sure that these variants are not going to cause another surge of infections. Beyond that, it's just the same message you've heard. Uh, be patient. It's not going to be easy to get appointments, um, but eventually, if you keep trying, you eventually will. That's it. Take care. Thank you, Dr. Barry Potvin. He is Professor Emeritus, Yeshiva University, Department of Biology. We now return to State Representative Kathleen Lenatra. Uh, Kathleen, what would be a takeaway today? 
takeaway is what we're hearing. You know, patience is a virtue. We all know that and stay vigilant. Um, we want our, our grandparents and my parents want to see their grandchildren and we want everybody to continue to be safe and have those family reunions sometime soon. So hang in there, everyone. We're, we're this light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. State Representative Kathleen Lenatra going back to Plymouth Public Schools, Carolyn Rains, Director of Health Services. Carolyn, your closing thoughts. So I think that one of the things I'd like to say sort of on a positive spin to close today is that um, 11 months ago, I don't think any of us could have believed what we've been through. Um, I think we'll come a long way. I know I've been very impressed in terms um, you know, of being a healthcare professional in um, the education world to see how well our district administration and certainly led by Dr. Campbell, um, how they have worked so diligently and so hard and continue to do so every single day of the week um, to make sure our staff and students and families stay healthy and safe. And um, it's just been a privilege and an honor really to also be able to have some increased collaboration with um, you know, community providers, with our public health department, with our board of health. I can't say enough about Karen Keene and about Dr. Podfin. Um, and so we just, we consider ourselves to be very fortunate to be in Plymouth and to be part of this group. And um, thanks for having us on today again. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn Raines, Director of Health Services, Plymouth Public Schools. We also thank Michelle Brady, who had to leave early and we're now gonna to return to Michael Jackman, District Director of Congressman William Keening. Mike. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, I would just echo what everyone's saying that um, to hang in there, um, and, and, you know, kudos to the schools, to the chamber, to the town, to our, all of our healthcare workers and, you know, the state and federal and county levels working together. Um, it's really, you know, coming on these shows every few weeks, it, it's great to share what we, we've been doing, but it's also great to hear all the things that are happening and hearing the, the numbers in terms of um, the rates going down and the, the vaccinations that are going out. It's a process. It's definitely a process. I know people are frustrated. They're certainly letting us know about their frustrations, and I'm sure the other officials are hearing it too. But um, we do urge patience and we do urge vigilance. Um, the vaccines are coming and um, we will get through this. So thank you. Thank you, Michael Jackman, District Director, Congressman William Keating. We move on to the Executive Director, Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce, Amy Naples. Amy, what do you have for us? Such amazing information. Um, every time I come on here, I learned so much today. I've learned so much um, and I'm so incredibly thankful and impressed by all of these panelists. Um, I just wanna thank them for their hard work, time and effort. And also to you, Steve and PAC TV for providing this platform that is so important for our community. I get phone calls all the time from people saying that they saw me on the show and. Um, this, all of this information is so important and it brings it back locally. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, as always, if I can be of any assistance, don't hesitate to reach out to me at 508-830-1620. Um, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Amy Naples, Plymouth Area Chamber of Commerce. And we're now gonna finish with our panel with Matt Muratori, Plymouth State Representative Matt. Yeah, Steve, you know, it's a lot of great information, a lot of information today, a lot of positive information, you know, and, and as Carolyn said, you know, we, we live in a great community that, you know, we all coordinate well together, communicate well together. And I think the success of the vaccination program is not, is not about where it's located. It's about what we're all doing and getting the word out and getting people directed to the right places and making sure people are tested and need to be tested. And, you know, and the Board of Health and the Board, uh, the Select Board have done a tremendous job of communicating and getting information out. So. I think we've been very successful as a community working together, uh, as Carolyn indicated. Just a reminder that your your friends, our call 211 is now open to, uh, seven days a week now. That's if you, you need help getting a, uh, an appointment. They're not, not going to, um, if you have access though to computers, um, they don't want you to call 211. Those are people that really don't have access. So uh, to call 211 seven days a week. Uh, or you can go to mass.gov forward slash COVID vaccine. Um, that will help you um, get vaccination appointments and vaxfinder.com uh, will actually get you where the vaccines are, are located um, within your within your area. Sorry, it's vaxfinder.mass.gov where the vaccines are actually located. 
So I, I think uh, as everyone has indicated, um, patience is, is, is a virtue as, as Kathleen has said. Um, and as I always like to say too, you know, continue to be patient, um, but as Walt Woodman always said, be curious and not judgmental. We'll see you next week, Steve. Thank you. Plymouth State Representative Matthew Muratorian. Thank you to Dr. Philip Trifletti, Dr. Barry Potvin, Representative Kathleen Lenatra, Carolyn Raines, Michelle Brady, Michael Jackman, Amy Naples. We now return to Ken Tavares. He is chair of the select board for the town of Plymouth. And Ken, once again, a lot of great information. Absolutely. The afternoon was filled with good, good new information. First off, Eileen, happy birthday if you're still watching. Wish you a beautiful day today. But I would uh, also like to take the, uh, the time to thank the small army of people that are behind every one of us that appear on this program each week. You see just a few of us. The army that uh, is working for the town, for the state, for the feds, for the businesses, uh, for our uh, workers in DPW, police, fire, ambulance services, they are carrying uh, the load and I want to thank them very much. There's been a, so much change that takes place. I, as I've said before, the only constant uh, in dealing with the virus is change and you have to be prepared for it. Today we saw that happen again and our folks are in the back of the of the room making sure that everything comes off beautifully and works so uh, and also as other members of the piano panel have uh, stated uh, we still need to remember those masks the distance and those hands it's very very important that we still observe the protocols that started uh, just about a year ago thank you Thank you, Kenneth Tavares, uh, Chair of the Select Board Town of Plymouth. Next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Mark Wilson. He is a local epidemiologist. Also, Sarah Cloud. She is Director of Behavioral Health and Social Work at the Beth Israel Deaconess in Plymouth. Heather Cosby, she is a CPA. And Stephen Cole, Executive Director, Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation. Thanks to all who have participated. Uh, I'm Steve Trifletti, Plymouth Town Moderator. And thanks to all our viewers. A special thanks today to Eileen. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Good day. Thank you for joining us.